we see today the return of the three wise men, our servers, and the Magi. The Magi did not make it here for the vigil mass. They were detained probably at an airport by someone fussing about their masks or something. But they made it this morning, and they're here to instruct us. There's a lot going on with this feast. We in the Latin church don't have as deep an appreciation for the Feast of the Epiphany as the Eastern Christians do. In fact, for them, the Epiphany is kind of a composite mystery. We think of it simply with respect to the coming of the Magi, but for them, it's, it also involves the baptism of the Lord and the wedding at Cana. They see that all these three, the Magi, baptism, and Cana, as one mystery of Christ's manifestation. At the baptism, there's a very Trinitarian manifestation. The Father's voice is heard, and the Spirit is descending as a dove. But Christ is revealed to the world, and in the preface to the Mass, and in the, not that so much the preface, but rather in the little incommunicantes bit for the Roman canon, it says that today Christ, God himself, is revealed in our human nature. There's a revelation of God that occurs in Jesus Christ because he is God. It's not just Christ's speech that is a revelation. It's his very person. This is one of the emphases of the teaching pontificate of Pope Benedict. He said, Christianity is not so much observing a set of rules as an encounter with the living God in Jesus Christ. If you like, Jesus Christ is in his person salvation because you have the coming together, literally the reconciliation in his person of God and man, the divine and human natures. And so salvation means for us to accept this revelation, to be baptized into his passion, and then to live out the Christian mystery ourselves. Always with the influx of divine grace, of course, not on our own. It's not a matter of just looking at a pattern and saying, well, I can do that too, and then imitating Christ in that way. We can only imitate Christ when we have that vital connection that we call the inflowing of God's life, grace. And this is not just for the Jews. This is the wonderful, one of the aspects of the mystery. And it was something that disturbed the early church because before the message started going out to the Gentiles, almost all of the infant church was Jewish. And it was thought, you remember there were clashes between, in the Acts of the Apostles, between the Greeks and the Jews. And the Jewish widows seemed to be getting all the attention. The Greek widows were getting neglected, and so the apostles said, we're going to set up deacons to take care of this because we have to preach. We can't handle this matter. But the idea was that in Christ, the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile has been torn down. And for us, probably most of us in this church, certainly most of us in this church, possibly all of us in this church right now, are from Gentile stock, not Jewish. We fail to appreciate the significance of this. But what the Jews were expecting, many of them, was a savior for Israel, a political savior, not someone who would invite other nations into the people of God. This was shocking for them. Many of them saw it as a betrayal, even though there were all kinds of Old Testament prophecies about this. Like the psalm we just heard, Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. The kings of Sheba and Saba will bring gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then there's the star. So many people mock the star, the Christmas star, and they say, this is ridiculous. How can anyone believe this? 
a star that moves and draws these wise men from wherever they were. Persia, some people think. And by the way, the Magi were probably something like ancient philosophers. Um, one of the Christmas carols calls them sages. That's probably right. We, somehow we started calling them kings, um, but they were probably not political leaders at all, but rather philosophers slash scientists in their days, watchers of the heavens, and they noticed this star. The gospel tells us that they noticed it and they were amazed by it and they were drawn by it. And yet you have many people saying, well, there's, you know, no record of any such star. In secular literature, no one makes any mention of this. There's a lot of reasons why it might not have been mentioned in ancient literature, secular literature. For one thing, maybe people just thought they were seeing things. Many people didn't write in those days. And maybe it was just something done by God for the very peculiar purpose of drawing these three wise men out of their country to come and worship. If God can create everything out of nothing, and if God can become man in Jesus Christ, it doesn't, it's not a very good idea to quibble at the notion of a star that you can't explain. I like to think that God just called this the birthday star for his son. It was destined to last for maybe a few weeks, a few months, and then just burn out happily because it had served its purpose. Jesus did his work on earth in 33 years and went back to the Father. Why not the star? But in any event, if you're, if you're quibbling about the star, while the central claim of Christianity is the incarnation of God, I'd say you're straining at gnats and swallowing camels. And if you're going to swallow camels, today's the day for it. These three wise men came and they worshipped. Now, on Christmas Eve we hear the story of the shepherds, not Christmas Eve, Christmas the Midnight Mass. We hear the story of the shepherds receiving this revelation. And the coming of the shepherds tell us that God comes for the simple, the unlettered, the uneducated, the blue-collar chap. It's not for the prideful. He does not come just for the wealthy, for those who think that they're something, but even for smelly shepherds who have been out in the fields all night. They come and they adore. And that's what human beings are supposed to do before God. The shepherds did what they should do. They believed the message of the angel. The angels told them, I bring you good news of great joy. Tonight a savior is born. Now presumably the shepherds were Jews themselves, so they knew what a savior meant. And they came and adored, and they must have felt very consoled by the fact that they didn't have to go into a palace, they could go into something they were familiar with, a stable where there was a manger. And they recognized the humility of God, and they adored. And today the other shoe drops, so to speak. God is saying he's not, didn't only come for the simple and the unlettered. He also came for the wealthy, for the educated. As long as their education and their wealth does not become an impediment to the humility of worship and the obedience of faith, that's what we're all called to. Christianity is a great leveler of all peoples. The wonderful hymns, the wonderful message that we have about, you know, kings and peasants together worshiping the same God. This is a wonderful thing. And it doesn't mean that kings are supposed to go back out after mass and start beating the peasant up again. None of that. It's supposed to teach us that we are all of the same human family. We are all of the same stock. God comes for us all. And God calls those who are not Jewish by a different manner, not by angels speaking of salvation or the Messiah, but rather by something they might recognize, a star. A star, if my theory is correct, just for them, but it drew them. 
they recognized something. They recognized it as a sign from God. And however murky or undistinguished their faith was at this point, they came. And they saw, and they too knelt and did homage, and they brought gifts. The good things God had given them. Gold, because Christ is a king. Myrrh, for his upcoming death. Myrrh is an ointment used for burial. Somehow it's a prophecy of Christ's sacrificial death. And then, of course, frankincense, because he is God. It's not a good idea to doubt the veracity of the Gospels. We should believe this. We should believe in the star. We should believe in the wise men, whatever their names were, whether it was Melchior, Caspar, Balthazar, whatever their names were. The scriptures don't say. That was later traditional attribution. But the central message of this feast is that Christ comes for all, not just those of his own ethnicity. Israel was to be a light to the nations. It was supposed to preserve the little deposit of faith until the time of the Messiah, at which point it was to become a worldwide, an international religion calling all to worship the one God, because there is only one God. The gods of the nations are nothing. They're the work of human hands. Only the Lord is God. And also, to have any kind of participation in the life that Jesus comes to offer us, we must humble ourselves. We must believe. Christ comes to bring about faith in our hearts now so that one day, as the opening prayer of the Mass said, we may see his glory. In this world, we don't. We get glimpses. I think even faith is glorious, but it's nothing, nothing compared to the glory of the God who in his perfection will be revealed to his saints and holy ones on the last day. St. Paul says the glory that we experience now is like, you know, it's like looking into a, he says, a glass darkly. In the ancient days, they just had pieces of brass for reflection. If you wanted to, you know, preen before the mirror, you had to go for a piece of brass and shine it up as best you can. But we have more sophisticated mirrors now. But that's what it was like. It's like looking sort of murkily into something, dirty water. That's what faith is now. But what we will have, what we will be, has not yet come to light, but it is promised. And it is held in reserve, it is held for us if we persevere and we die in this faith and in the love of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself to come among us in our frail human nature.